Thanks, Ian. Um, just to acknowledge the co-authors of this paper, Craig Kern from DAFWA, who may or may not be here, and Rob Norton, who is definitely not here. Rob is the Regional Director for Australia and New Zealand for the International Plant Nutrition Institute. Um, warning up front, this is an opinion paper. It's not a technical paper. It's our opinions. Um, it does contain a couple of pictures, but mainly it's opinions. Right up front, that's a quick snapshot from some work that uh, Craig Scanlon and Ross Brennan did, surveys of people like you in workshops. And it's pretty scary that if people who are advising on nutrient management think that there's such massive room to improve. So I think it's pretty undoubtable that um, if these best management practices have been so successful, we probably wouldn't have had this situation coming from these sorts of people. What I'm going to talk to you today about, um, three things. First is, do we know what the hell this best practice nutrient management term actually is? And if we do, do we know how to do it? Um, second point, what evidence have we got that the best practice nutrient management thing that we've been banging on about for 10 to 15 years has actually made any differences? Um, and for that matter, how do we gauge how good our nutrient management is full stop right now? What indicators do we have? And how has this best practice nutrient management changed things on my farm and in my bank account? Because that's probably the most important thing. Uh, thirdly, some ideas. It's not a cliche shift the paradigm sort of idea. It's just some subtle ideas around about how we might do things slightly differently. And quite interestingly, these line up pretty well with what Alistair and Andy spoke about this morning. This is an interesting exercise I did um, early last year with a series of growers. Uh, you might want to try this sometime. Just sit them down over a cup of tea and say, what do you understand by best practice nutrient management? The most common, I most common response is, I have absolutely no idea. And various things after that come out um, that vary from how nutrients are used to how or what products are purchased. So it's probably unlikely if someone doesn't know what best practice nutrient management is, is to keep ramming it down their throat and thinking that it's going to make any change. But maybe that doesn't actually matter. Um, maybe the advisors know what it is and they can advise the growers on how to do it. So again, another snapshot um, on just one small part of nutrient management. This is um, the approach that these um, advisors' clients take to investment in P. And the reason I put this up is it just highlights that there's this massive variation in the thoughts around this. And we'd say that it would be pretty sort of horrible if we were, if everyone had the same thoughts and there was some sort of consistency in it, because that would mean we're trying to do the same thing in every region in every year and for every client. So the variation is not um, surprising. But the reason I put this up in conjunction with the previous slide is it sort of reinforces that amongst growers and advisors, if the idea of best practice nutrient management is to um, standardise thoughts, approaches, actions, tactics, implementations, well, it probably hasn't done a very good job. But Maybe that's not what best practice nutrient management is about. Maybe it's about implementation and the doing things. Maybe it's about broad guidelines on how to manage nutrients um, and sticking to the proven things through thick and thin. However, we look at um, responses to what happens when things get tough, you actually see that it's the fundamentals that seem to drop out. It's the things that we've espoused, it's the things that um, stewardship programs like FERC care are built upon of soil and plant testing, making sure your pH is right so you maximise your nutrient efficiency. Those are the things that seem to um, sort of disappear quickly. Agronomists for some reason seem to hang around. The dropping out of lime is a very interesting one um, because as you would have all heard many, many times and you'll probably hear many, many more times today and tomorrow is that Acidity is quite a 
big and widespread problem. You've probably seen this in various shapes and forms um, where soil pH or acidity seems to be a problem and soil phosphorus doesn't. Um, we could have a, probably a two, three day forum and discussion and argument over what the critical levels for pH and phosphorus should be. Um, the fact that we probably needed to do that would probably highlight that one of the fundamental things to do with nutrient management, which is critical levels, still hasn't been sorted out. So how are we going to espouse to people that we should be um, doing things when we can't even come to consensus on that sort of stuff? So as we say in the paper, if that is an issue, that's probably one of the first things we need to sort out. Nonetheless, um, David Weaver and Mike Wong are pretty sensible chaps. Um, and even in 2011, if they're having a bit of an off day and got these levels a bit wrong, it is still something not quite right here. The reason I'm putting this up is that it highlights that on a state level we've probably got something out of whack, yet we have been doing best practice nutrient management. So how did we end up um, in this situation when we've been participating in stewardship programs and telling everyone what to do? If this is sort of a rough picture at what's happening at the um, state level, it's probably, well it has to be built up from what's happening at my farm and my paddock level. This is a, a recent example of um, something that appears to be a little bit out of whack. It, it's a real example and it's a recent one. These are the coal phosphorus tests. Um, the recent fertiliser Better fertiliser for decisions for cropping project has come up with a, a level of 24 milligrams per kilogram as a critical level. Beyond that, it's extremely unlikely if um, you're going to get a response. Personally, I have no idea how that 24 relates to profitability because I thought that investment in anything was actually about making returns and profit on it. But nonetheless, we'll, uh, we'll push on because. 24 is the magical number that the industry has thrown at us. Um, and we can see that there's a couple of sites that are below that. There's a couple of sites that sort of are less than 150% of that critical level. And the rest of them, the blue and the greens, are by BFDs or anyone's standards, are probably pretty bloody high. These are the recommended phosphorus rates that um, were given to this farmer on the basis of those test results. Um, seven and eight kilos of phosphorus per hectare. Now, there's probably many, many very good reasons why they were recommended. And I'm not putting this up to say that whoever's done that recommendation is incorrect. What I'm actually doing is um, putting this up to show you probably a case of something being out of whack at the farm level and how that builds maybe to the state level. Because these are the topsoil pHs. And the green ones are 5.6 to 5.8 and everything else is less than 5.5. And none of them are actually high enough for any lime to chemically move through to any subsoils. And these are the recommended rates of lime. And again, I'm not putting this up to say that whoever's done this is right or wrong. What I'm putting this up for is to say that there seems to be, at this paddock and farm level, something out of whack. So it's probably no surprise that this is then building up to a state level that is looking a little bit out of whack as well. But hopefully there's some very good reasons why these lime rates were recommended and those phosphorus rates were recommended and hopefully maybe they were even communicated to the grower. Because we know there's a lot, a lot of reasons why what appears to be out of whack nutrient management could actually be sensible nutrient management. We know for a fact, particularly in the developed world, that across the world, excess nutrients get applied. We also know that excess nutrients, or the money invested on excess nutrients, is not wasted. I mean, there's many reasons for that being that the cost of changing the logistics of fertiliser use, so we're talking about transport and storage and all those things, is more expensive than the perceived benefit of doing those things. 
We know that high rates or excess rates of nutrients are very good insurance against my farm being different to everyone else's. All the other trials that were done for the better fertiliser decisions, my place is different. It's good insurance against seasonal variation if you get a better season. It's good insurance against um, change in price. Um, it is a good idea because if things are good and I've got a tax problem, I might as well invest in nutrients now and have a bit of a buffer for when things get a bit tighter. So there's plenty of reasons why what appears to be good nutrient management could be poor nutrient management. However, even if we can justify that to ourselves, we've still got a pretty big job convincing the community, whoever that is, the powers to be, the ones who give us the licence to operate, we've got a pretty big job convincing them that we've got everything under control. And if we did have everything under control, farmers would be pretty comfortable with how they use fertilisers and the prices of them. And I don't think we've got to that point yet. In addressing these sorts of things that we see in the media and elsewhere, uh, do we really have the evidence to say that we've got it under control? Leave it to us. It's self-regulated, you don't need to step in. Um, and do we really believe that, even if we say it? We can, um, we can roll out a number of care accredited advisors and those sorts of things, but really, has that made any difference on farm, on paddock, in my bank account? So how do we actually tell the community that it's good, that we've got it all under control? How do we know for a client that their nutrient management is pretty close to perfection and there's no room to move, as opposed to another one that could be a bigger environmental nightmare who needs to improve. What's our benchmarks? How do we gauge that? This is some stuff that's in the paper. It's very broad indicators of nutrient management in WA and it looks as messy as any other graph that you've probably ever seen. What's it actually tell us about nutrient management efficiency? And I'll move on to that in a second. But the reason I'm heading down this pathway is that most of you would have heard of French and Schultz's water use efficiency number of 20. Whether you believe it or not, it is still a recognised benchmark against which we can compare season to season, farmer to farmer, paddock to paddock. What do we use for nutrition? This is exactly the same information presented a different way. So this is the amount of kilos of nitrogen and phosphorus that we've used to produce a tonne of grain. And we have rough numbers for nitrogen, like 40 to 50 kilos of nitrogen is required to grow a tonne of wheat. We average about 27 across that 10 years. Um, so that's probably saying we're doing a pre reasonably good job and there must be about 20 kilos of nitrogen coming from legumes and soil sources. So that's good. But is that 27 actually a good number? Do we have room to improve? Um, because if it is, let's just say we've got nitrogen covered, tick it off and move on to the next thing. And what's a good number for phosphorus? If we compare ourselves to the rest of Australia, sorry, the whole of Australia, of which we're part of, and the rest of the world, or the whole of the world, we can see that with nitrogen, we use about 30% more than the rest of Australia to grow a tonne. We use somewhere between 10 and 15% more nitrogen than the rest of the world to grow a tonne. We use about 11 kilos of phosphorus per tonne. Uh, the rest of Australia uses about eight, and globally, they use less than four. So four compared to 11. So does that reflect that we have very infertile soils? Or does it reflect that we're using phosphorus inefficiently? Quickly go back to this and we have a look at the variation over time. At rough current prices, the cost to grow a tonne of grain with two variable costs, nitrogen and phosphorus, ranges from $40 to $100 per tonne. 
We often hear, and we've heard a couple of you know, sort of half snipes about it this morning, that it's all dependent upon the season. Well, if it is, let's not worry about the variation between $40 and $100 a tonne. Let's just say it's all dependent upon the season and live with it. And if it is, that seasonal variation is absolutely huge and it puts any variation in fertiliser prices into perspective. They're quite minuscule. So let's stop whinging about that. And again, let's build a bridge and get over it and move on. Maybe I'm being a bit facetious, um, but I think we probably all know that we can probably do a bit better than what we currently are. The current focus of nutrient management is largely around fertilisers. Now, the classic example is we'll figure out our compound fertiliser, then we might add some sulphur and some potassium where it's required, then we'll top up with nitrogen, then we'll consider trace elements, then we'll maybe put some lime on. Right? It's an additive approach. We're just building, 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 it's costing us more. Rather than figuring out what is the most limiting input and where in, which input is likely to give us the best return for our investment. And spending, I think as Alistair or Andy said this morning, spending our scarce dollars the best possible way. Current focus is also largely devoid of financial quantification of likely returns and risks from the different inputs. The better fertiliser for decisions for cropping information does not mention dollars, returns, financial risks, margins, anywhere in anger. Yet, our largest input costs, which we think we would probably be most focused on, the profitability of, um, we're almost treating like it's, it's just a biological system, not that it's part of a farm business. The third point is um, that we're quite reactive to soil tests. Now, soil tests have been and continue to be a great servant for nutrient management, there's no doubt about that. But we're quite reactive. When we get our soil test results back, it's then that we start thinking about where did this sample come from? Are there any other yield limitations there? What's the likely yield? for that site. How big an area does that site represent? So it seems that we've got this great tool and we're probably using it a little bit arse about. So is it time for a slight change of tack? We probably think that the point of diminishing marginal returns has well and truly been reached with just trotting out the same old technical information. We've had that probably for the last 35 to 40 years and it hasn't changed a lot. Um, and we also believe that if we continue to espouse that we need to do best practice, nutrient management, maybe it's more about how to figure out what I can do on my farm that improves my bank account. And I'll go through some of our ideas on what are a, a slight change to the approach that's been taken. But I think that's Alistair again made the point this morning that a good agronomist is key to it. And I think we've got a lot of good agronomists in this room um, who can probably have a think about this. First step is to identify areas that could be managed the same way. Right, it's pretty basic. It's something that we probably all do at some point in time. What we're saying is let's do this up front. It really doesn't matter what the type of information is. It could be, like Andy said this morning, his uh, brain could be all tied in there. It could be drives across the paddock at 50, 60 k's an hour. It could be EM surveys, FERT logic, yield maps, Google Earth images. It could be anything. And it doesn't even have to be um, absolute. You know, it could be that this area is different for that area. Just as an aside, and I think we've made the point in the paper, it's quite ironic that we have so much of this information now. Our ability to capture it is just colossal. Our ability to use it for nutrient management is, hasn't really kept up. Next step is a little bit harder because we actually have to go to the sites and actually figure out what's going on. This is probably where the good agronomist comes in. That's the bad news. The good news is the only tool you require at this stage is a pair of eyes. And most of us could see if it is a different soil type to somewhere else, if it's non-wetting, is it crusting, is water running off, those sorts of things. 
Um, characterisation of a site probably doesn't, or shouldn't go to the extent of a yield profit site characterisation because there's a lot of other cheaper information that we can do to, to get there. And again, this doesn't have to be absolute. It can be relative. The next bit actually takes a bit of effort, either on a, sho on a shovel or with something mechanical. And this is about looking for subsurface constraints. And this is probably an area where stewardship programs can really deliver some value for the people that they're training. And I'm pretty sure that a lot of the agribusinesses and people who are paying for stewardship programs would be looking for something that gives their uh, participants a bit more value. The next step, everyone's going to bang on about this over the next couple of days, is to figure out if there's any non-nutrient limitations can be cost effectively fixed this season. Because if they can't, suck it in, live with it and adjust your inputs accordingly. Next step is to actually go back after having verified what's happening in the paddock and check that the areas that we identified earlier on are actually correct and maybe change those. And then we start to estimate yields. The nutrient requirement equation is pretty bloody basic. Right? It's demand minus supply and demand is driven by yield essentially. Yet the number of times that someone will give us a one yield for wheat across a whole property is just phenomenal. When there's so much information out there to the contrary of that. So if we've got half of the yield, oh sorry, half of the equation wrong to start with, we're probably in a bit of trouble. Um, at this time of the year, there's always discussion about what yield do we put. Um, my advice to people is the average yield is, well, it is the average, so it's highly likely that uh, that's a good starting point. And at this point in time, that's probably all we know, so let's put that in. Then the next step is, if needed, soil test to de determine, the, determine the four R's. Now, the four R's is IPNI's right product, right place, right time, and right something else that I can't think of. Um, but we've said here, soil test if needed. And the if needed is about if we've been to that site before and we've got soil tests and everything looks good and it's correlating with what we're seeing in terms of production, why are we going to go back there unless that's for a monitoring purpose? Let's go and put our soil test probe somewhere else and learn something about another spot. A few thoughts around this approach. Right, it's not a computer solution. Someone asked a question this morning about IT overtaking our brains or something, I think it's what it was. Um, so it's not a computer solution. It does require local knowledge and agronomists. It does require ground truthing. It may require some training. Um, and it's not necessarily just another thing about talking about potential of variable rates. Craig Tobin last year presented this to you. Um, that apparently homogenous paddock, $50 per hectare difference by going out there, doing a bit of smart thinking and changing a few inputs and quite interestingly, Alistair came up with a similar number this morning. I'll just finish up with this because this, this sort of represents a starting point for varying rates within a paddock, right? It could be more yield maps and biomass images and thoriums and all those sorts of things on it. But at some point we have some information and we're going to try and extrapolate from sites that we know to somewhere in the paddock and call those land management units. We do a little bit of a tweak here and a little bit of a tweak there. But let's put that into the context of the whole farm business. Again, this is real data. Where red is a high requirement and green is a low requirement. Our little paddock here, we could go to the nth degree of trying to tweak that and get a couple of one, two percenters, but in the whole farm business there's probably bigger fish to be fried. Then let's put that into context of other inputs and we start to see that where we might have been putting blanket rates across the whole farm, etc., we've actually got a bigger requirement for another input here. And those of us are doing this, we probably 
Now this morning it was mentioned that we picked all the low hanging fruit. I don't think in nutrient management, which is our most expensive variable cost, that we've got anywhere near picking a lot of the low hanging fruit. This fruit is out there ready now to be picked and we've already got the tools to do it.